All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Mindful Hunter. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And today, me and Colton are getting together for another episode of Guns and Stuff, this time with Zach from Nosler. So we went deep on what Nosler has to offer the market and some of the differences in their product categories and which of their products might be right for you and which might not. So this one was rescheduled from about a month ago. We did our best to get to all the questions that you guys had asked on Instagram. Expect many more of these. There is a uh, pretty decent chance we should have Hammer on sometime in May. And between now and then, Colton and I are going to do... Uh, go back to just the two of us. There's a ton of leftover questions that from all the recent episodes that don't really fit with any one manufacturer that me and Colton are going to do our best to answer for you guys. So lots more cool episodes of Guns and Stuff on the way. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. There is less than two weeks to go in the bear hunt giveaway for foragedinthebackcountry.com. So for every $5 you spend, you get one entry to win a guided black bear hunt in British Columbia with primitive outfitting. I will accompany you on that hunt, I will film that hunt, and I will upload it to the Mindful Hunter YouTube channel. So forgedinthebackcountry.com, every $5 you spend gets you one entry. Uh, As always, if you appreciate the non-sponsored, unbiased gear reviews and you want to join a community of like-minded hunter, mindful-reviews.com. Come grab a membership and uh, join the community. We would love to have you. So without further ado, a new episode of Guns and Stuff with myself, Colton, and Zach from Nosler. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel, and this is another episode in the Guns and Stuff series with myself and Colton, and we have Nosler on the line today, and so the goal is to kind of have a high-level discussion about different you know, ammunition options in the hunting category, and then get into some specifics about what makes Nosler different. And we opened this up to questions from the audience about a month ago. We had a bit of a hiccup in scheduling, but we're back on track now. So we've got all those questions and we're going to try and address them. Um, I, I'd like to go around and do a short series of introductions because I actually even got some questions about Colton last time because I realized I hop into this stuff and some of my people don't know Colton and some of Colton's people don't know me. So maybe Colton, give us a brief kind of background and some of your expertise and then we'll move over to Zach. Yeah. So um, most of the listeners are going to know me from the Pap Winkle page that I run um, on Instagram, uh, just dedicated to precision rifles and hunting. Uh, content from an unbiased opinion. Um, my background is just a lifelong hunter, probably 30 years big game hunting. Um, also as a big game guide, um, spent some time in law enforcement as a sniper. Um, so competition shooter, just kind of well-versed in all things precision rifle, but with an emphasis on hunting is, you know, my true passion, um, with the bull guns. So that's me. And also my I should say, um, I'm a freelance writer as well as the associate editor for Western Hunter Magazine. Um, so you can read articles and stuff that I produce in those publications. Excellent. Uh, Zach, quick intro. Uh, like I said, my name is Zach Waterman. I've been the public relations manager here at Nosler for 15 years now. So with that, I've been able to, I've been fortunate enough to go on several big game hunts. Uh, like Colton, I've probably been big game hunting myself for about 30 years. Um, I just, there's nothing like it, nothing that compares to it. But, um, along with that, uh, being an employee of Nosler, I know I see the quality and dedication that our employees, the owners, the the family run business that they put into that product. And, uh, you know, our our company saying is quality first. So we're not going to sacrifice anything, uh, for quality. So, um, I'm happy to, to answer some questions today and looking forward to the podcast. Maybe. Maybe before we dive into the specific questions, maybe it would be helpful. Um, and you sent over some material prior to this, so I'm going to open that up once I ask this question. Could you maybe give us an overview of kind of the structure of the Nosler offerings, kind of what some of the broad product categories are, and then a little bit about like what makes I understand like 
you know, an adherence to quality and stuff, but from a more, from a more of a technical perspective, what are some of the things that make a Nosler bullet different or what are some of the technologies or approaches that you guys use that you think would set you apart from your competition? Well, as far as categories go, um, originally, so for the first 65 years, I'd say 60 years of Nosler being in business, all we made were bullets or projectiles. So whether that's for hand loaders or other ammunition manufacturers to load a Nosler bullet into our ammo. And then um, in 20, say 20, 2008, we started kind of diversify the line with Nosler rifles, Nosler loaded ammunition, and Nosler component brass. And since then, a couple of years ago, we added a uh, Nosler suppressor. So there's several different categories we have uh, diversified into, which has been very good. Uh, like when I started in 2009, our catalog was 25 pages and now it's like a hundred pages long. So it's, we've really grown in the last 15 years, which has been a lot of fun for a PR guy. I have a lot of stuff to talk about, but, um, but as far as what sets like, say a Nosler bullet apart, I'd say our hunting bullets, um, with our manufacturing method, uh, we use a process called impact extrusion. Most bullets in the world are used made with a cup and draw or cup and core bullet, which is just a, uh, that's how our match bullets are made. Some of our varmint bullets, our handgun bullets. Um, it's a very economical and uh, it's a great way to make bullets. But for a hunting bullet, it's kind of, it can make for unpredictable or unreliable terminal performance. So at high impact velocities with that thin copper jacket, it's going to become kind of frangible, not give you that weight retention and energy transfer you're looking for. And at slower impact velocities, there's a good chance that those bullets are going to kind of pencil hole and wound the animal, but not necessarily a mortal wound. Can I so hop in and, we and do, interject just for one second? You yeah. use the term frangible. I feel like I can intuit what that means, but if I don't know what it means, there's probably other people who don't know what it means as well. So frangible means it's going to come apart. Okay. Okay. Um, That's what I figured. And not hold together and give you that weight retention you're looking for for a, a nice deep wound channel. Okay, perfect. Thank so you. So for our hunting bullets with our impact extrusion, uh, it, it has a tapered jacket. So the jacket is going to be thin at the nose and then get progressively thicker and thicker down towards the base of the bullet. So what that does is it gives you a wide range of impact velocities and that bullet's still going to perform reliably and predictably and uh, give you that energy transfer and that hydrostatic shock that you're looking for for a hunting bullet. Okay, perfect. That makes a lot of sense. And then what are some of your, you know, cause you always hear about Nosler Acubond. What are some of your more popular big game hunting rounds? As far as like cartridges? Yeah. So right now the 300 Win Mag, 180 grain Acubond is like the king that we can't make enough of that stuff. Um, 28 Nosler, 175 grain Acubond long range is right behind it. And then you've got, you know, your 308s. Uh, 30 odd sixes, uh, gosh, 300 wisdom is still real popular. So kind of the, you know, your normal, and then you've got the new, you know, the, the, the PRCs are, are huge too. The six, five and the seven PRC. And we're even going to be coming out with the 300 PRC here later this year. Well, that's interesting. What type, cause right now there's really only one, um, factory offering. Are you going to come out with a full, are you just coming out with the bullets? Or are you going to come out with like a full factory loaded option for the 300 PRC? Uh, brass and ammo. Okay. Okay. Do you have any idea what type of grain offerings you're going to ask or offer? Or is I that still don't under know. the hood. Right now, I think it's going to be the 210 grain Acubon long range and maybe the 180 grain Acubon. Maybe the, I'd like to see the 200 grain Acubon in there myself, but yes, we'll see what I the would, final decision is. I would say 200 grain Acubon. That would be it. And that's one of the questions we got was when is 300 PRC coming? So I'm glad we hit that topic. Yeah, that's yep. exciting for me because for a guy who doesn't load, there's really only one real factory option. I mean, they have two variations, but there's really only one factory option for the 300 PRC on the on the market right now. And I almost feel like the gaining popularity of the 7 PRC might not bode well for us seeing a whole lot of other options for the 300 PRC because I feel like if you were in a corner and could only develop one, I think you'd be hard pressed not to develop the seven because it seems to be gaining in popularity over the 300, but I could be wrong about that. That's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's like for seven, because you have seven millimeter fans and six, five millimeter fans and 30 caliber fans. And, and, uh, 
they each kind of cater to their own cartridge and caliber. Yeah. It is a great time actually to, to be, you know, a rifle guy. Cause I feel like you are very hard pressed to not find a great option. Like there's there, the differentiation between them is getting so small that you don't have to make these big leaps. It's not like, do I shoot a 300 Win Mag or a 308? You know, you can, you can really narrow in. Now, this might be an overly simplistic question, but I would love to know the difference between, because you hear about Nosler Acubon, you hear about Nosler Partition. Like those would be kind of the two biggest buzz, buzzwords from a cat's getting rather aggressive. Uh, the two <laughs> biggest buzzwords as far as Nosler goes from more of a lay person like myself. Could you just give me like a fairly simple explanation about what makes those two bullets different from each other? Yes. So the nozzle partition was our, the, the very first bullet that the, um, the, basically the designer of the inventor of the bullet, John Amos Nosler did, uh, back in 1946 is when he made the first prototype. And so John was a, a truck driver, he owned a truck driving business. And he knew that, um, when you had a full trailer, you put the brakes on that trailer is going to keep pushing you, uh, forward. So what he did was he designed that into a bullet where it has two cores. It has a front core that made, is made to mushroom and expand and give you that uh, energy transfer. And then there's a partition in the middle where there's separating a rear lead core, which gives you that weight retention and that driving force to push that bullet through. So um, that bullet, but he actually tried to shop that bullet around um, to different bullet manufacturers and machinists to see how to make that bullet. Um, would it work in theory? And they all agreed like, yeah, in theory, it looks like it would work, but there's no way to mass produce this bullet. You're going to basically have to hand make these things, which doesn't make them very profitable. So thank you, but no, thank you. So John ended up coming back home from his big road trip and said, well, I've got this much time and energy to spend into this idea. I'm going to hand make some of these bullets. And so that's what he did. He went got some books at the library on machining and different metals, bought some d different uh, lathes and things like that, and handmade some of these partitions. And uh, he actually did some terminal performance testing on them, like shooting in a wet newspaper, comparing the depth of penetration and weight retention compared to the bullets that he was using. And in theory, everything was looking good. Uh, and then hit at a... And accuracy testing, he was getting pie plate accuracy, meaning he was he could shoot a pie plate at 100 yards, and he thought for moose hunting, that was pretty good. So he ended up going up next year to go moose hunting and got as close as he could, and the moose went down, the bullet performed just as he hoped it would, and started making more and more of these bullets. So, um, and, and it just took about a year and a half later, you know, giving these bullets to his friends and other sportsmen he knew in the area, and by 1948, he was so busy running the trekking company and um, coming home at night, eating dinner, and going back to the shop and making these partition bullets that his wife kind of sat him down one day and said, John, you know, we'd like to have you be part of the family again. So if you could pick the, tr the trucking company or the bullet company, we'll support you either way. So he liked being in the bullet business more than he liked driving a truck around. So he sold the trucking company and started the Nozzler Partition Company in 1948. So that bullet was the the cornerstone, the foundation of the company all the way up until say the mid eighties when they came up with the ballistic tip bullet, which is the polymer tipped um, hunting bullet. And, you know, some years later, those bullets shot excellent, very well, they, you know, tended to be more accurate than the partition. So people wanted a bullet that performed like a partition, but were as accurate as a ballistic tip. So that's where the Acubon came in. So the Acubond is basically a, a design of the ballistic tip, but the lead core is bonded or welded to the copper jacket. So that gives you higher weight retention. So the, the partition is designed to have about 60 to 70% weight retention if you're able to recover that bullet. Uh, the Acubond is also has about 60 to 70% weight retention, whereas the ballistic tip has 50 to 60% weight retention. So not quite as much. So the, the, the Acubon was made to, to fly like a ballistic tip and hit like a partition. Okay. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And even seeing the life cycle and how those bullets are actually interrelated from a design perspective makes, yeah. it, makes a lot of sense. Um, that's kind of my, my, all my overall questions. 
Colton, do you got any high level stuff or do you want to dig into some of the Q and a stuff? Um, well, we're on the subject of Acubons. I mean, it's, it's well known that it's one of my favorite bullets, um, for, for big game hunting. Um, while we're on the subject of it, um, talk about the, the generation of the Acubon long range. And that is like the next progression of the Acubon family. So with the, uh, the new technologies out with optics and powders and cartridges, you know, but once used to be a long shot at three or 400 yards, isn't a long shot anymore. You know, with that technology, people are able to shoot way farther than they used to be. So we needed to kind of come up or, or design a bullet that was able to expand at slower impact velocities. Cause if the bullets traveling at, you know, say our Acubon, for example, has a minimum impact velocity of 1800 feet per second. So with most cartridges, that's going to be up to 600 yards. And that bullet, after that, that bullet slows down to a point where it's not going to expand anymore. And so the Acubon long range has a softer nose to it. So it still has a tapered jacket. It, the core is bonded to the jacket for weight retention. So at high impact velocities, that bullet's still going to hold together. But that bullet has a, a minimum impact velocity rating of 1300 feet per second. So that allows you to kind of reach out there for those hunters that are able to hunt at those longer ranges. Um, and, and with that, uh, on that ABLR, that obviously is a different shape, um, to increase that BC, um, we get a lot of questions about that bullet being finicky. Um, and you know, we've talked about it and, and, and a lot of guys in Nazar have, have mentioned, you know, it's like, well, it's kind of sensitive to seating depth. Um, what, what's your guys' approach at Nazar? What do you guys, what's your response to that for people that ask? Um, so typical long range or high BC bullets, t um, have a, like a tangent ogive, which like to be kind of set closer to the lands or shorter seating depth. Um, or the, actually, yeah, they, they like to be up towards the lands where the Acubon long range has a, a tangent ogive. And so did I say tangent or secant? You said, first tangent, said, both you times. said tangent Sorry. both times. I know you meant right, yeah. the first time. <laughs> decant the first time. Yes. All right. Yeah. And then, so the, the Acubon has a tangent OJ, so it's a little bit more rounded. It likes a lot more jump. So it likes at least 50 to 60 thousandths jump to the lands, if not more for, for better accuracy. Yeah. And that's, and that's one thing where I think it throws a lot of hand load. And this is, this is specific to hand loaders for guys that aren't hand loading. And buying factory nozzle or Acubon long ranges, you don't. This doesn't apply to you. It doesn't matter. It's it's not a it's a it's not an issue for you. But for the hand loaders, I think a lot of guys get into a bad spot with that bullet when they're so used to loading everything. You know, five ten thou off the land. It's like, well, this bullet doesn't shoot. Doesn't shoot. So it's like, well, did you shorten it? Did you bring it back? Well, no. I got a full case of powder. I can't bring it back further. It's like, well, it, that's a loader issue, not necessarily a bullet issue. Um, and that's always been my response is just backing them off or starting a hundred thou off and then creeping up and forward has always worked better for me as opposed to cheating them back. I start a hundred thou off and then work my way forward. And typically, like you said, a hundred thou to 60 thou seems to be a, a good place, um, to get that accuracy out of that bullet. Um, for, for me, um, yep. no, that's what we've seen too in the lab. And then you know, I had some questions, um, Oh, on, on the, uh, the, you spoke about the, uh, the growth of the company and the bullets and then your own brass, um, talk about your brass and is it made in house at your facility there in Oregon? So, uh, back in 20, I think it was 2013, we purchased a company called Silver State Armory that had brass manufacturing capability. And so we brought that in house and we make more and more every every year our own brass in house some of it's still um we've still purchased from outside vendors or outside brass manufacturers but um most of it is made in house yes i got you and so what does the process of that look like for you guys i mean as far as sourcing the brass um the, the raw brass the material and stamping it and what is the process that you guys are using in comparison to some of the other companies making you know high-end brass that would be competitive in your guys's market 
Um, it's been a, a pretty big learning curve as far as manufacturing brass. I don't know if, if you're familiar with like the cup and draw process on making a bullet. Like you get the 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 copper strip and then you form it into a cup and then you draw that cup out. It's yeah. very similar to that process, but instead of being in all in one press, each one of those processes is its own machine. So it goes to the cupping machine and then it goes to the um, the draw machine and then it goes to the trimming machine and then it goes to the, another machine that cuts the extractor groove and another machine that puts the head stamp on it. And then it goes to the, the, another machine that um, pierces the flash hole and then it goes to annealing then it goes to a forming press that for, forces or forms the shoulder and neck. And then because we formed that brass, it got work hardened. So then it gets annealed again and then washed and polished. So it's it's a kind of a lengthy process, but it's it's at each machine it's running pretty quick. So if you keep the things moving in between each machine, you can go through a run pretty quick. Gotcha. And having having the ability to make your own brass, has that helped you guys stay on top of production of ammunition? Versus Immensely. having to source it out. Yeah. So not having to rely on other manufacturers for our production process has been a huge advantage in the past 10 years. And the quality, what's your guys' QC process on the, on the brass? Where it's, you know, um, is it sorted by just weight or is it measured? Um, what is your guys' system in that? Typically weight sorted. Yeah. Just weight sorted. So we'll, yeah. We have a weight sorting process that keeps everything very consistent. And just like your bullets, are they all hand inspected and, and viewed by one of your employees throughout the process or at the end of that final process? Yeah. So at each station has a um, employee that actually is going to be measuring weight and overall length for that process. So they're going to be making sure. So every say 500 rounds, they're going to be weighing um, say diameter, overall length, weight, just to make sure everything is where it needs to be because eventually, you know, any moving part is eventually going to wear out. So, and you're going to see that on, you know, weight specifications or all the tolerances that they're not where they should be. They're going to stop the machine, get a machinist involved to see what tooling might need to be swapped out to get it back into specification. So they're constantly, we have our QA team is constantly uh, involved in that process. And on, on the topic of QC, on, on your bullets, can you explain kind of all the different processes you have in place for for those machines? I was out there, uh, what's it been, two years now when I toured with you guys? Uh, yeah. And this seeing everything there is quite interesting because those machines are, you know, they're stamped what government property. They're so old, you know. Yeah. Those, they're... Those, it, I thought that was just a cool thing that people aren't, you know, most people don't see and aren't privy to that information of, of getting to tour and check out that stuff. And I just thought it was a super unique um, experience to take my son and, and see all that stuff and to see the processes. Cause I know he was, you know, six, seven at the time. And it's just like, man, I had, he had no idea how bullets were made and thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, and I did too. It's just, I've seen bullets made, but not, you know, my first time checking out the, the Nosler line, but um, talk about that process and, and just the QC and those machines, because I know we <coughs> talked about it in person there about, you know, there's always a guy checking on and making sure that everything is running and those those machines are, are staying within those specifications for each bullet. Right. So uh, at each one of our presses has a press operator, depending on their experience level. If they're a new press operator, they're going to have one press that they're kind of in charge of making sure it's being fed raw materials. Um, if it's an experienced press operator, they might have up to three or four presses that they're in charge of um, overseeing. So each press operator is in charge of doing quality checks. So say after a, a thousand strokes, let's say every time the press goes up and down, uh, that press operator is going to take a sample from that press, whether it's a copper jacket or a finished bullet, um, and then they're going to they're going to weigh it. We have a comparator machine, so they can kind of put it on a, a slide projector almost to make sure that the form of that bullet is exactly what's on that template. So if anything's out of um, specification, they're going to get, again, a, mach a machinist involved to get that back into place. Um, same thing with our finish presses on our hunting bullets. They're constantly weighing overall length, caliber, weight, like weight specification is plus or minus a half grain. So very tight weight tolerances on the on their finished pro products. Um, and then also what we call is a lot bin. So it's basically a rectangular bucket that weighs about 35 pounds full of bullets. So if it's full of 45 caliber, 185 grain bullets, there's going to be a lot less in there than there would be 22 caliber, 55 grain ballistic tips. 
So anyways, our biostitians are going to go through and take a sample from each one of those lock bins and then take it into the lab and shoot it for accuracy, accuracy and pressure. So if it doesn't meet um, our accuracy and pressure, the, the ballistician is going to go turn that machine off and, again, get the engineering team or the machinists involved to swap out machinery or tooling. Luckily, our ballistician has been doing this long enough. Where they're going to see a certain group. They're going to know what tooling needs to be replaced on what machine. So it's, there's a little bit of wizardry involved there, but um, it's amazing what they can do. So there's several layers of, of quality control. And those, those ballisticians for, for everyone else that hasn't been there, it's, it's connected, right? They can literally, if I remember right, it's just like one small business or like building section away where those guys can just walk up and grab bullets, correct? Yep. It's all connected. Quick yep. question about- yeah, so they're going to- a quick question about lots, because one of the things, again, as a guy who buys factory ammo and I'm, and I'm, and I'm not a hand loader, I've had it said that when you buy ammo, it's good to be buying, um, like large portions of the same lot number. Cause you know, you get a new rifle, you go buy three or four different options. You put it all through, you see which one your gun likes best, but having, you know, when I got my 300 PRC, I bought five boxes. I still have three and a half boxes because I don't shoot a whole lot. And they all came from that same, from the same lot. How important mm -hmm. is that if you're looking for, um, like a repeatability or to be able to expect the same performance from, a, you know, a bullet. And I guess the same thing would, would go true with, with other components. Like, is this, do you got to worry about this with powders? Do you got to worry about this with just raw bullets? I'd like to know what type of um, fluctuations or how important is it to have things from the same lot? So if for accuracy reasons or purposes, what you want to do is reduce variables. So if it's the same lot, typically you're going to have whatever variables are concerned with that lot. If it shoots in your gun, then it's going to have, your gun's going to like that powder. It's going to like that overall length. Um, it's going to like that typical bullet or, you know, depending on what the ogive shape might be. So if you can keep everything as simple or as similar as possible, that's where you're, um, when it's in the same lot, you're reducing those kind of variables. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. <clears throat> And how often is, is Nosler changing um, those recipes as far as propellants and, and seating depth? Is that something you guys are changing quite frequently or are you guys running a lot of the same, same stuff over the last several years? Because like with the, when, you, when you speak to the 300 wind mag, the trophy grade 180 grain Acubon load, like that's one of the best all around 300 wind mag loads I've tested. And if a rifle doesn't shoot it, it's probably not going to shoot. Um, and I've always wondered like if it's the same recipe, cause I'm, I've been shooting, I still have some of those cases from, whew, I don't know, probably, probably the first year you guys started releasing that maybe mm -hmm. second year, I've got a, a large stock of it cause it just shot so dang well. And you guys had a special one year at a show. I can't remember. It was like buy one, get one free or something. So yep. you guys were delivering pallets of ammunition to my house. Um, <laughs> Is, has that has that load changed over the years, or is that something that stayed pretty constant? Because it, it, it's a consistent performer. So that one in particular, we try not to change. Um, but over the last few years, like anybody, powder was kind of hard to like. Maybe we couldn't get our hands on H one thousand for a certain loading, so we had to find a different powder that was going to give us similar accuracy and velocity. So we had to kind of scramble, just like you know most hand loaders did. <laughs> But we, since then, we've got, um, you know, contracts with powder manufacturers and we're a lot more consistent in the last few years or last couple of years, I would say, than we, we were like, especially during the pandemic when things got a little dicey, but we try and keep things as consistent as possible. Gotcha. Um, going back to our question line, I know I had a couple more. Um, I got a quick were... one about production. Cause you mentioned, you know, the C word there. And everybody was frustrated, you know, my round's not available. This isn't available. Can you speak to some of the, and I, you know, it really helped. I had an initial conversation with Colton on one of the podcasts and he talked about the retooling that is necessary from going from producing one caliber to producing another caliber. And, um, I would like to know from a manufacturing, you know, perspective, what were some of the challenges you guys faced 
during that time? What were some of the solutions you came up with? And what would you say the prognosis is right now as far as, you know, availability of, of different calibers and some of the less popular ones that people, you know, tend to be waiting a little longer on? So our, our, probably our biggest challenge was um, employment, basically getting people mm. working um, like everybody experienced, like where did all the, you know, where did all the employees go? And then um, also the we did experience a couple of times where COVID would go through the production facility and we'd have a skeleton crew out there. I mean, there was more than, a, more than a few times I was, you know, on the production, not production floor, but I was an IMP packaging bullets or packaging ammo. Like we needed to get stuff out the door, but we didn't have enough bodies to do it. So uh, that was probably our biggest challenge at one point. Um, but another kind of misconception is we don't have any dedicated presses. So we don't have a press that just makes 180 grain acubons and another one that makes 165 acubons and 150 grain acubons. They all share the same press. So if we're making 180 grain acubons, we're not making 165, 150, and 125 grain acubons because they all share the same machinery. So that's kind of based on the production schedule, what's on back order. Um, so, you know, we tr- we try to make as much 180 grain acubons as we can, but like I said, if we're, we're for making those, then we're not making the other stuff. So um, it's kind of a, a balancing act trying to get everything made. And unfortunately, um, like the eight millimeter and 35 cal, those also share sort of the same presses, but the back orders on those are a lot smaller at this right. point in time than the more popular stuff. So we're just, we're trying to make as many people as we can happy, but sometimes you can't make everybody happy. Can you give me a sense of scale? Like on some of your more popular options, like a 180 grain AccuBond, like how many of those guys are you spitting out a year? Um, I'm not allowed to talk numbers, but it's, okay. I mean, it's okay. millions. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So, yeah. But, um, and because of the, the complications we had in the past, we've actually been able to kind of examine and make a lot of more ac- or, uh, efficiencies in the p- production process. So like, okay, here's, here's our goal today, this week, this month, this year. And so our production staff has a clear line of what they're, what's expected of them, what we need to be doing. And we've been able to make a lot more bonded products in the last year than we ever have. And where would you say we're at in the life cycle of these kind of supply and demand challenges? Do you feel like you're getting ahead of it and we can optimistically tell people that in the next two to three years, we should expect to see more reliable options on the shelf or realistically, it's still really hard. Everybody's doing the best they can and we're just getting out the door what we can get out the door. So it's been interesting and and part of it is purchasing habits where, you know, you're 10 years ago, if you went to, like when I go to the go, the store to go get ammo, I'd buy two boxes of ammo and that would last me a hunting season or two. Yep. Now people see five to 10 boxes on the shelf. They're taking everything on the shelf because yep. they just don't want to look for it again. So the next five people that come to look for that item, it's not on the shelf. So when they finally find it, they buy as much as they can. So, cause, and it's hard because every shelf in the, in the world that we sell to got emptied at one point. So restocking and refilling all those shelves is going to take a little time, <laughs> yeah. but we are, we're, we're starting to get caught up. We're starting to get ahead of it a little bit, but it is going to take a little bit more time. Yeah. And I see Colton recommend this all the time. I really think it's something you have to take into account when you're choosing a caliber these days, like be realistic with yourself, you know, like, yeah, I love the seven Psalm. Are you going to be able to like, just walk into the store and buy some? Probably not. Um, I do think, Picking a more like a, th- it's probably one of the reasons 300 Win Mag will always be popular because the odds of you walking into a Cabela's and seeing a box of that on the shelf is just way higher. And let's face it, like that's a that's a showstopper. I don't care how great your your rifle and bullet setup shoot if you can't actually find <laughs> bullets to put inside of it. That's a problem. Yeah, that is definitely something to consider um, in this day and time. 
funny you say that the seventh psalm is on our production schedule this month <laughs> okay it's been well, there's some good news it, but, i have quite a few yeah. you know seven psalm buddies uh living in bc sheep hunting is really big and that's a that's a particularly popular sheep caliber because you can get away with a bit of a lighter a lighter rifle and a shorter and a shorter barrel um so i do know lots of seven psalm guys uh so <laughs> that's some good news for them yes but you're right i mean and i've heard that for years you know if you're go to hunt in a different state or a different country or Africa. What can you find on the, on the shelf if your ammo doesn't make it? And seven sums probably not going to be on the shelf in South Africa or, but yeah. Um, but if you're a hand loader, you know, you can get by with stuff like that sometimes. Yeah. Okay, on the back, topic, to you, back to you, Colton. Oh, yeah. Um, on the topic of, uh, of selecting projectiles and cartridges, um, what is, what is Nosler producing the most of? I know you mentioned the 300 Win Mag, and the seven, I was surprised to hear the 28 Nosler is one of the highest production um, ammunitions for you guys. I, yes, it is. And I think part of it is because there's not a lot of 28 Nosler manufacturers or ammo manufacturers out there. So, but like with 300 Win, everybody makes 300 Win Mag. Right. And so. And for that to still be one of our most popular is kind of a testament to the popularity of that, that caliber of that cartridge. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Um, and I think I speak for a lot of people. If you guys could just stop making six, five Creedmoor bullets and rounds <laughs> and just dedicate that machine to 300 wind mag, the world would be a better place. We make a ton of Creedmoor ammo too. So yeah, it's that, the popularity of that cartridge is crazy. We got someone's got to cut them off. All right. Everyone has to cut them off. <laughs> kind of in that craze um so we can have more 30 cal acubons um on the subject of there's a lot of questions about kind of specifics um as to what you know you would recommend or from your experiences because you you have have you got the opportunity to hunt quite a bit all over the world um and nozzler obviously spends a lot of time testing bullets and has a large history of of alaska and africa and stuff like that and developing products um one of the questions is what would a uh, Nosler or yourself recommend for uh, bullet model caliber and weight for Alaskan bears, grizzlies and brown bears? What would so, be something you would recommend and what would be something that's very popular request for you guys, for guys going to do that? So I went on a brown bear hunt once and when I saw the size of those things in person, my 338 wind mag didn't feel like it was going to be enough. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I would go 375 on a brown bear. That would be like my ideal. I know some of there's other brown bear guides that carry 416s, like big, heavy, dangerous game, because it is a big, heavy, dangerous animal. Um, but minimum 250 grain, uh, like a partition, would be my favorite just because it's tried and true. Um, it's been around for 75 years doing what it does. Um, that's what I used. I had a 250 grain partition and I put four rounds into that bear in about 30 seconds and it still ran another 30 yards. So it was a thousand grains of partition out of a 338 wind mag. And I mean, it was it, the first two shots were fatal, but it was still running. So and I still had ammo, but yeah, I would go 375 would be my ideal with the 300 grain I'd like partition. To- add a little something to that as well. <clears throat> I do a lot of black bear hunting in, in, in BC. And I'm a, if I'm using a rifle, I'm a front shoulder guy with black bear because there's tons of bush and I'm looking to drop that bear on the spot. Yep. If I got to put in another one to finish him off, I don't care. I don't want him running out of sight. And then I got to go chase him and it's an absolute night nightmare. And I've yes. talked with a few of the Alaskan guys and it's a big priority up there as well. It's not just about killing the bear. It's about stopping the bear from getting into that hellish undergrowth where stuff gets real dangerous, real fast. Could you yep. talk about different bullets abilities? Like two bullets can kill, but one might be able to kill with some more damage or maybe not get the penetration of the other one, but have a more catastrophic wound channel on the way in and how that would play into you know, different choices on different hunts with different animals. So like you mentioned, then there's no, you're not always going to get that perfect broadside shot. Sometimes yeah. you might have a quartering two or maybe a little bit quartering away. So you're going to want a bullet that's going to give you a deep wound channel. It's, it's going to penetrate as far as possible. And, and you have the two camps of people that want the bullet to stay. They, if the perfect shot would be 
the offside hide catches the bullet, meaning that animal got every ounce of um, energy from that bullet. And, this, and there's the other camp that likes an exit wound. They want to be able to have, you know, an entrance and exit to, to follow a blood trail if you need to. Um, I'm more of the first camp where I want that bullet to catch on the, on the offside. But um, yeah, on a, on a big, heavy boned, heavy fur, heavy um, meat animal, you want a heavy, a big, heavy bullet. Yeah. It goes penetrate as far as possible. Also, uh, one of the questions that we got here and also one that I get a lot, um, what is the best uh, bullet option, caliber, or weight um, for North American hunting inside 500 yards? Well, our most popular for that is, is that 30 cal 180 grain Acubon. Yeah. It does anything you want it to do on any North American game. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that one. It's 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 hard to beat, and and it was it was it was hard because during the, the the pandemic and and all the shortages, everyone was just well, what can I switch to? I can't get acubons. I can't get them. What can I switch to? And it's like, hey man, like at this point, whatever you can get is what you get. Like there's no the options are limited across the board. It wasn't specific to the acubon. Obviously, it took you know I, I would say what was it two years about yeah. that there was no yeah. acubons on the shelf i mean at least for me here in montana i'm i'm starting to see them now um last probably six months but it, it was probably at least two years with my memory serves that there was none yeah it was i mean we couldn't make them fast enough that's for for sure and it, it got to the point where you know hunting season's around the corner and people are calling us like hey i need this bullet and I would be, I've tried to find even like competitors bullets online that I'd steer them to. I'm like, I don't want you to stop hunting this year just because you can't find an Acubon. I need you, you know, we want you out in the field regardless if it's with our product or a competitor's product. So yeah, everybody was scrambling for a couple of years there. And on the, on the topic of, of the, the production schedules and, and the shortages and stuff, I think another aspect that a lot of people didn't understand and, and I don't, I don't have a full grasp of, but I, I do know you guys produce a lot of bullets for ammunition manufacturers. And I think people kind of lose track of that. They're like, oh, there's no way that there's that many people buying bullets. It's like, well, there's also companies buying bullets in a lot larger volume to produce ammunition that you're going to buy. So um, can you speak to that at all as far as like, you know, your production with other manufacturers and sales to those companies that use your bullets and, and, and the kind of the scale of what that is? Yeah, so um, so like the two big OEMs that we sell to would be like Federal and Winchester. So, and they are obviously giant companies, big ammo manufacturers. So, in an increase, in, they had a giant increase in demand as well. So, in addition to our ammo lines and our hand loaders, we were trying to do the best we can to supply their or fulfill their orders and their demands. So, it was just a big, a giant push of demand on on all sides and all fronts for us. Because they're running all a lot of hunting bullets from Nosler specifically in their brands, not specifically just the Acubon, but the partition and everything else. And when you guys are having these machines cycle through different lots and different calibers and different weights, it can be a long time between uh, manufacturer dates, correct? So, right. So, I mean, it could take, you know, a few weeks to do a certain run of a certain bullet and then that machine gets retooled to do another weight. Like I mentioned, the goes from 30 cal 180s to 165s. So it could be a few months. It could be several months between before we cycle back to making a certain bullet again. I'd like to circle back to the ideal bullet for 500 yards because one of the recurring themes we've had you know, it's kind of a funny term to use, but it seems like everybody's expecting this magic bullet that's going to be just as lethal at a thousand yards as it is at 200 yards. And one of the things I'm learning more as we have more of these, you know, bullet related podcasts is that is, you know, my bread and butter is gear reviews. And I always tell people, if you try and buy a perfect tent for all 12 months, you're going to have a tent <laughs> that's really no good at any of the months. You right. need to have a piece of gear for each specified application without going crazy. But like with a tent, I think two or three, realistically, if you're going to be like a, a full-blown backcountry hunter, you probably need two or three tents. Now, I'd like to talk about some of the trade-offs 
because I think people are preparing for the unicorn case. Well, I want a bullet that's going to be good out to 700 just in case. And if they went and looked at their actual shooting history, they've never killed anything over four. The odds right. of, of you going out to eight are, are almost zero. Can you talk about some of the trade-offs in performance of like the Acubon versus the ABLR and like kind of prime distances for each and then where those bullets might not be prime and what you shouldn't like, let's match expectations with performance. Cause I think that's where a lot of disappointment comes from is when people have an unrealistic expectation and then it doesn't perform and they get upset and it's like, well, if you'd done your homework, that bullet was not designed for what you were trying to use it for. So I'd like to hear you speak about that a little bit. Sure. So you mentioned that 500 yard mark. I would say ideally the AccuBond would be 500 and in and the AccuBond long range 500 and out. Okay. So that would be for like the sweet spot for both. Um, but the AccuBond long range, we did, like I mentioned, we bonded it. It's got a thick jacket towards the base of the bullet. So if you do have a shot that's inside a hundred yards, it's still going to hold together. It's not going to come apart. Um, and basically could just like become frangible or explode. It's still going to hold together. It's not going to give you that weight retention. The AccuBond is because it's going to really, um, uh, expand, but, um, yeah, that would be the ideal. So we tried to make that. So the AccuBond long range has an impact velocity rating of 3,200 feet per second maximum and 1,300 feet per second minimum. Whereas the AccuBond has an 1,800 feet per second minimum and an unlimited maximum. So, yeah, let's say that 500 yards in, 500 yards out between the two bullets. And do you find size of caliber matters? Like I have my own little pet theory. So I shoot a 212 grain ELDX precision hunter out of a um, 300 PRC. And I've shot bears at a hundred yards and I've shot animals significantly further. And I have never had any of the issues that other people talk about with these, you know, long range dominant bullets. And one of my theories is it's 212 grain, 30 caliber bullet. Like I don't care if you're 50 yards or 200 yards and that thing smacks into you, you're going to feel it. Do you think that some of the smaller calibers are more susceptible <laughs> to being more impacted by the range and the velocity that they impact at? I would say so. I would agree with that. Plus in higher velocity too. So if a bullet, a smaller bullet, especially hits a scapula or rib bone, it's more up to veer off course or, or even like a ricochet right. um, and not give you that, that boom channel that you're looking for. Whereas a, a 212 grain, 30 cal bullet is going to have a high sectional density, meaning it's going to be long uh, and give you better penetration um, capabilities. So that's, I mean, people ask me, my favorite caliber or cartridge is 338 wind mag. So, and people ask me, well, why do you hunt with that? And I don't like tracking animals. Like it just kills them right there. Yeah. So, um, and that's, again, it's a long, heavy bullet. That's going to give you a nice deep boom channel. Yeah. That's great. That kind of, you know, that, that matches up with my own kind of anecdotal experience. And I don't want to get on the whole 30 caliber bandwagon, but it's really hard living in North America to not make an argument. If you're only going to have one gun, I mean, it's a, it's a really sensible option. Yeah, I mean, look at thirty out six. It's been around for since nineteen oh six, so it's it's a pretty proven testament. It was pretty funny. I grew up in Ontario, and everybody shoots a thirty out six. And I moved out to BC and bought a thirty out six. And you almost get this like these sideways looks. Like in, in the West, it's a very un. I don't know a single person in British Columbia personally who owns a thirty out six. But I grew up like everybody had one where I grew up. So it's so yep. funny how that you know, option has kind of fallen out of favor in, in recent years. It has. And, and just because there's so much new stuff out there, yeah. you know, for, for so many decades, it was the 30 out six and then the 270, and then, you know, the 308 eventually. And, but now there's, I mean, gosh, looking through our reloading guide, there's like hundreds of cartridges that you have to go through now that, and like you said, you can pick which one you want for each specific hunt or, shooting match or it's, it's just kind of fun. Yeah. On the topic, uh, uh, on, uh, I'm scared. I keep referring to on the topic. I need to change my, my verbiage there. Um, <laughs> but going back to, uh, cartridges and, and everything else that Nosler has, you guys do have a, a new line of rifles, um, and suppressors. 
um, not necessarily, you've been in the rifle game for a little while because I tested an early 48 that you guys had um, a while back. Um, talk about your guys' rifles and your suppressors as well because I've got an opportunity to shoot quite a few of, of each and, and they're, they're, they are high quality products that I think people should keep in their, their eyesight for their next purchases where you may not see them as much as some of the larger brands of suppressors and, and rifle manufacturers, but you guys do have some really good products. Yeah. So we have, like you mentioned, the model 48 series, which is our uh, Nosler model 48 action um, that was designed in house. And that is, um, we screw on a carbon fiber, barrel or carbon fiber wrap barrel onto that and then um, carbon fiber stocks. So they're generally pretty light. There's the Model 48 long range and then the Model 48 mountain carbon. So it's more, it's a six pound gun with, you know, not loaded with ammo or not a scope on it. So it's very light. Um, it's got a 24 inch barrel. So you're not, you know, it's not unwieldy. And then we also have the, our latest is the Model 21, which also has a um, McMillan stock on it. Uh, match grade shill and barrel, and they're all threaded to accept our suppressors. Um, so it's a five eighths by 24 thread pattern. And then our suppressors, we have um, an aluminum titanium and an, a titanium. So the titanium is going to have a higher heat rating. The aluminum titanium is a little bit lighter. So if you're it's a hunting rifle where you're not putting a ton of rounds through it, that's kind of the ideal way to go. And then we also have a, uh, uh, the K can, which is basically it's two inches shorter than our standard suppressor with two less baffles, but it it still has great um, sound prevention or sound reduction, I should say. So there are about three decibels in difference between the K can and the standard can, but it's for hunting purposes, it's a lot shorter. So you know, if you're going through trees and bushes, you don't want a, a you know a four foot long gun. You want something kind of shorter to to go through the forest with so um it's been incredibly incredibly popular excuse me and um very effective but on the, it's been fun to see on, as far as um, correct me if i'm wrong your suppressors vary a little bit differently um from a lot of the typical uh baffle designs whereas if there's a baffle strike or something damages a suppressor it can be repaired at home correct like a simple or not necessarily at home but it's not a you don't have to restart over with a whole new can and serial number you can you guys can rebuild them um with right relative ease correct yeah you just send it back here and we can with our tooling we can take that suppressor part replace all the baffles inside uh with brand new baffles put it back together and then send it right back to you uh because the blast chamber is what's serialized and so you're going to keep the, the blast chamber portion and then the baffle the baffles we can swap out no problem so no, no need for another background check is that particularly useful for the regulatory component? Like it is such a nightmare to get approval for one of these things that to then ding it and have to restart that, that process would be a bit of a nightmare. So being able to stick with that same serial number saves the end consumer a bunch of headache. Yeah. It saves them about a $200 tax stamp and, uh, up between a six and nine month waiting period. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a big headache to do that. Why do you think more, why, why aren't more people doing that? Or do you think you guys are just the first to get onto it and you'll have a few more people jumping on your coattails? I would imagine. I'm, and I'm not sure we are the first to do it, to be okay. honest with you. But uh, we we just thought that was a design that would be make a lot less headache for everybody. No, makes sense. Totally makes sense. And I'm not sure. I, I don't know if there's anybody. I'm sure there's other companies that have similar designs, maybe. But for the most part, they're they're welded and it's it's a device. I mean, if something goes wrong with one of those baffles I, I don't know how they're gonna tear it apart and put it back together without you know having to redo the whole um the whole thing so as far as my concern when I, or as far as my knowledge base goes when i've had cans have issues or seen them i've never personally had a can a bit with a baffle strike but from buddies that have had issues with them they you know destroyed the can and had to start over um, yep. with the whole thing so they're out a thousand bucks plus you know another thousand bucks and 200 bucks and a year, which the, the I'm over a year now on my last can and I'm still waiting over a year for an e-form. And I see guys getting stuff done in a, in a month now. And it just blows my mind that I can still be sitting here waiting over a year. I mean, I'm not surprised it's ATF, but it's still frustrating. Well, at I'm least you can use that, that's all I've got to say as a Canadian. 
Yeah, at least you can use them. <laughs> at least you can have the opportunity to wait a year. To, to wait a year, one. yeah. yeah. At least you <laughs> yeah. can get on a list. <clears throat> yeah, that is true. But that's the things we complain about here. Yeah, that's funny. Um, the one last question I had um, that somebody had sent in, I wanted to go over, that I get a lot of. Um, the price on it, Nosler bullets. Um, I, I get a lot of it guys saying, Hey, you know, I like their bullets, but they're expensive for what I get. I can get a hundred of these for less or the same price. Um, and we've talked about the quality and I know the difference and, and, and I, I get it. Um, but kind of a go over it again, in terms of you know, Nosler's standpoint on, on the, on the price point and like the new price point on Acubons and, and the increase there. Um, as to where that is uh, coming from and, and, and what people are getting for that money when they are buying 50 bullets as opposed to 100 from another manufacturer. Right. So a lot of it is kind of what everybody's dealing with. Um, increased labor costs. Uh, we, had to, I mean, we were competing with a local Chick-fil-A paying people $20 an hour to make chicken sandwiches. And we're not making chicken sandwiches here. So we really had to up our... Um, our, our hourly wage here for production staff. And another thing is our production of our hunting bullets specifically is a lot higher than our competitors. Because when I mentioned earlier that impact extrusion process, so that bullet goes through uh, a shear and bump process. So basically there, there's a big coil of copper wire and that there's a machine that sh uh, shears those into copper slugs. Then we have to anneal those slugs, so it goes into an oven for about 30, 60, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the size of the slug. Then it goes to a jacket press where it gets pounded into a copper jacket. Then it goes to a finish press where they're going to introduce the lead core and form the nose around it. And that's just for the ballistic tip. The partition still has the bonding process to go through. The partition actually goes through two different annealing processes. So our hunting bullets take a lot of time to make. And that's one of the reasons we were having a hard time catching up because our bullets do take longer to make than a lot of our competitors using like the cup and drop process. So, um, but yeah, that's just a lot more labor, a lot more time, a lot more capital that goes into these bullets or honey bullets. So I remember when I was over there, I said it was a couple of years now um, for that tour. And we talked about it. You guys were mentioning the, 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 the labor issues and, you know, the, the struggle with getting people to actually work. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that component. They'll, they'll go to the store and be like, oh, there's no one here. I got to do these self checkouts and, and they'll bitch and complain <laughs> about it. But then they don't realize, hey, the company's making your bullets. They have the same issues. Same with the people who make your barrels or the completed rifles or all those things are going through the same struggles. Um, and I think people kind of lose sight of that in, when they're when they're buying it. Because I know I did. when I, I shouldn't say I, I, I lost sight of it. It's just when you go to the shelf and you start to see bullets nowadays or even powder now, you're just like, Good Lord, yep. it is so much more expensive than it was, you know, five years ago, you know, 10 years ago. Um, everything's gone up. And, and, and I think people have forgotten that. There's a lot of people making each part of everything we use. And, it, you know, it comes with a cost because you're right. I mean, I was getting burgers with my kids the other day at a local little burger place that I haven't been to in uh, several years. And they were hiring and it was 20 bucks an hour to flip burgers and i thought yep. man this is crazy i was doing that stuff when i was a kid and i was making six you know seven yep. bucks you know minimum wage back then it, it's insane to me that you know people can get paid that to do that so I, yeah what does it cost to run a machine that's you know making hunting bullets at a high high level of, of quality you know you got to pay somebody who really cares about what they're doing because they can get paid a lot of money to do nothing Basically. Exactly right. Yeah. And and our raw material prices typically parallel fuel prices, which have skyrocketed in the last couple of years too. So um, with raw material prices increasing, labor prices increasing, like you mentioned, powder prices increasing, um, all that goes into effect with what we can charge or what we can price stuff at. I have another, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, bullet specific question. Okay. British Columbia is heavily timbered. And so it's funny because a lot of people see all this, like, you know, the famous Western hunting and they imagine spot and stock and glassing vast majority of my British Columbia hunting experience is still hunting. I live in the lower mainland, so I do a lot of blacktail, but even a lot of my buddies <clears throat> 
who hunt mule deer up in the interior are still in very thick timber. And I know around where Colton is, he's in a lot of that same stuff. Is there a bullet that would lend itself to that? You know, the original question said a hundred yards and in, but I'm going to say sub 200, that kind of more still hunting in the timber um, experience where you're not even going to be just under five, you're going to be way under five. Like what type of, of bullet options should I be looking at if I was going to have a gun dedicated to that type of hunting? Well, I personally don't have a lot of experience hunting in those kind of circumstances, but I've been told over the years that big and slow is the best for heavy timber and, and brush. So right. a big, slow, heavy bullet. Is there any particular else, options that come to mind, something. Colton, for you? Um, the one thing I've always kind of noticed is, you know, the tip design as well. Um, like a flatter tip, um, yeah. in my time with law enforcement, you know, testing, testing barrier rounds, um, you know, everybody's running, you know, what, what is available, but there's small companies and very few companies that were manufacturing bullets specifically for penetrating glass or barriers. And the ones that had a very flat tip were really good at defeating glass or defeating, you know, any type of, you know, I, I guess you could say brush or anything that was right. between you and the target. That flat tip did a really good job at keeping that bullet driving straight and forward. And where the pointed bullets, it would just catch whatever, whatever it was hitting and it would just run it like a ramp down the side of that bullet and deflect it off. And if the bullet hit, it was keyhole. It was sideways. Um, more often than not, the bullet would, was unrecoverable. You would never even hit the target. And we're talking, some of these targets we'd be shooting at were really large pieces of paper so we could see exactly what the bullet did and how far it traveled. And some, you'd miss the whole sheet of paper. You know, and I say a sheet, I'm talking like three foot by three foot, like a giant target six feet behind you know a barrier an obstacle that we were trying to defeat or shoot around or shoot through to see what we could do just testing bullets and so um yeah slower um bigger uh three thirty calibers definitely did better 338s do really well if you can find one with a flat enough nose so i think a partition would be a very big pick for me um in those larger calibers 30 cals 338s 375s would be where I would go based on my experiences with it. Again, not necessarily coastal hunting, you know, deer and stuff inside a hundred yards, but just experience testing bullets and playing with them. That always seemed to work well for me. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I think I we're agree. wrapping up here. Did you have anything else you wanted to hit on Colton from the question list? <clears throat> um, no, not that I can think of, but there was, there's was a lot of questions that were unrelated um, to this specific conversation in, in this last go round, um, which we can talk about. Yeah, we're right going to need to have a catch up one soon. There's been a few of those floating around. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, the 300 PRC information is uh, very interesting. And obviously a lot of people are also waiting on, you know, seven PRC options. Just as we close out, anything cool coming down the pipe or interesting that, you know, you, you want to let people know to look forward to here in the next, you know, come, you know, months and, you know, second half of the year type of deal. Um, like you mentioned, the seven PRC and 300 PRC are kind of the, the big ammo, um, introductions that we have coming out. Uh, but one that's exciting for me is, uh, seven rem mag. We're going to be starting making that brass in the house here next month. Okay. So we're going to get caught up on seven mag, which has been a long time in the, in the wait. So, um, looking forward to that. So, um, but yeah, any other questions you can reach out to on our website at nosler.com and, and send us a question and we'll answer you directly. Well, this has been great. Uh, you know, I, as, again, I'd like you to thank you for taking the time Zach and, and rescheduling when we had a, a bit of a blip there. I think this information, you know, one of the great things about all the options available today is that there's a lot of options available today. One of the drawbacks is, you know, I remember when I was 13 and went moose hunting with my dad, there was like three options in the world. Like it was, it was pretty yep. simple choosing what gun you were going to buy and what ammo you were going to put inside of it. And, but I think the drawback of today is just, it is overwhelming the amount of options that people are faced with. And then you know, some of the locations where the information is coming from, some is more reliable than others. So I think the more conversations like this we can have that are kind of fact-based and just diving into the technical details, the better armed, pardon the pun, everyone will be to make, you know, good ammo decisions. So again, I, I thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It's funny you mentioned I was at a, a 
firearm store last week and and the the shelf had so many options for every different caliber and cartridge you're like what even i in the industry was overwhelmed like holy moly how's somebody supposed to make a decision with all these options yeah, it's it's very challenging. My my background was in behavioral insights and behavioral economics, and there's this thing called choice fatigue. They once ran a study where they had a a shelf in a grocery store that had three types of jam, and then they had another similar grocery store, and they put 24 types of jam. And the grocery <laughs> store with three ch- types of jam outsold the other store to like an, you know an order of magnitude greater degree of sales. And it's because people look at this, this shelf of 24 jams and they just walk away. I'm like, I can't do it, right. man. I don't know what kind of jam I want. The other thing <clears throat> that's very interesting for people who are listening with children is that the more options you express somebody to, the greater their buyer's remorse is. And so when you're only looking at three jams, you're going to buy a jam and you're going to go home. And you're going to feel great about that jam because it was only three. I took my time. I'm happy with the jam I got. When there's 24 jams and you buy one, as soon as you leave the store, you're like, shit, maybe I should have got that other jam. And I think that is what, well, A, that's why our kids are always pissed when they get home from the toy store because there was too many toys and they wish they had got a different one. But more importantly, I think the reason we and Colton get half the questions we do is it's people trying to validate the purchase decision they already made. And it's like, if I have one piece of advice, if you, if you did the research and you made a choice, just run with it because you're going to, you're, you're better off practicing with that choice and hunting with that choice. than you are continually reevaluating your decision, looking for, you know, the perfect caliber for every single animal and, and that kind of stuff. But I do think it's a challenging environment for the consumer these days with so many options available. No, that's so true. That's an amazing point. And yeah, we learned about that in college. I think they called it cognitive dissonance or yeah. like buyer's remorse basically. So, um, and that's kind of one of our um, efforts is to reduce that in our customers and, and try and educate them on what they're getting and what they need it for and the uses that they're going to use it for. And, and, and like you mentioned earlier, we mentioned earlier, 30 cal, 180 green Acubon, like, you know, that bullet will do anything you want it to do. You don't have to worry about it in any circumstance or it's, it reduces your, uh, your remorse. Yeah. hundred percent. That kind of, that kind of, those kind of decisions, but that's funny. But what did they call that? Buyers choice remorse? fatigue nah. and then buyers choice remorse. Fatigue. So the, the choice yes. fatigue causes you to defer a, a choice. And then the buyer's remorse causes you to regret the choice afterwards. Man, that's so true. Yeah. Anything you want to close out with Colton? I know. I appreciate the time, man. Um, it's good catching up. Um, yeah. It's been a while since we got to chat and, and I appreciate you, you know, hitting the, the 180 green 30 cal acubind out there and not saying six, five feet more. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, have yourselves a good day. We'll chat soon. All right. Thank you guys.